are watching T Radio V, Radio in TV. He's absolutely Jason, he's absolutely gay. He'll absolutely brighten up the darkest rainy day. He's funny and loves movies, he's smart and he's a Jew. He's an actor and an activist and wants to hear from you. Welcome to Absolutely Jason Stewart with my guest, Rich Chasler. Hey, how are you, Jason? Rich is an old friend of mine. We've known each other at least 25 years. I think uh, actually close to 30, believe Where it Where did we not. meet? In front of the Laugh Factory. You remember? I absolutely remember. There's oh. a weird story as to why I actually remember. Tell me. Um, okay. Oh, just so everybody knows, Rich is an actor and a comedian and, and a true survivor in this business of the ups and downs yeah. of trying to make a living as, a, as an actor comedian in show business and it, it, an incredibly pr prolific career and we're gonna talk all about that but I always love to talk about how we met I don't even remember well I was working I was 20 years old it was 1980 <laughs> and uh, Ronald Reagan was president at the time oh my god all right it, just to give you a little setting I was working as a guard at Paramount Studios oh god I worked as a guard at, at, at ABC I knew that there was a guy at Paramount working on Cheers named David Reed who had written a play called I know, Panic, Panic in Griffith, Griffith, Griffith Park, Park, which I was in. Which you was in. Which you was in. I was in. You, you was in I, that play. I, I, yeah, what are you talking about? So I didn't know you. I had only known that I wanted to audition for this play. I didn't even know what it was about. I just knew some uh -huh. guy from Cheers wrote a play. I didn't know it was about the Lyndon LaRouche syndrome and locking homosexuals in a, you know, like. I, it was the first time I ever did anything where I played a gay guy. Oh, really? Yeah. Well, it was a great play. Did you see it? I did see it. Oh, because wow. Because I had to see it because I knew David from Paramount. So of course. So I was sort of like, I had to go see it. But uh, I, you were outside the Laugh Factory one night, and we were introduced like it was like a Tuesday or Wednesday night where a lot of us were just hanging out trying to get on. Uh-huh. And I said, oh, Jason Stewart, are you in this play called Panic in Griffith Park? Because, like, I was really... I was probably really impressed that you, you knew that. Well, you shouldn't be. I just was trying to impress the guy from Cheers by remembering what he was doing. Uh-huh. <laughs> was he there that night to see no. me? Oh, because a lot of them had come to see me at the factory. Really? Oh, yeah. Maybe that was the night. Who knows? It's possible. But oh, it, wow. Yeah, but I was, like, 20, and all I wanted to do was work so badly. And there was this guy from Paramount had this play, and I, you know... Oh, wow, of course. I, and I knew him, like... I saw him every day when I'd be riding my bike around the lot, you know? It was 1986. It was 1986. I was a baby. I had hair. Mm. So I had you. hair. Long hair. Thick, beautiful Woody hair. Woody Harrelson had been one of the backers of the play, and, uh, and that's how I met him the first time, and he came backstage really? and said the nicest things to me. It was the first time somebody that famous had ever talked to me, and he was, of course... Barely famous at the time. Woody on Cheers, yeah. you know? But in those days, he was really famous because TV shows were just it. If you were a regular on a TV show, man, there even a recurring only, character. Yeah, there was only, back then, there was only three plus one network. Yeah, uh, Fox and the other <laughs> yeah. Plus one. Yeah. <laughs> so tell me, how did you start? You started in New York, am I correct? Um, stand up or acting? Which did you start as? I started uh, as an actor. I started first. as an actor, yeah. and I always knew I wanted to be an actor. There was never like an issue about like what my future was gonna hold for me. It was always gonna be acting. And I started very young. I was seven years old, and I started doing plays in school. So did I. And the next thing you knew, I was getting cast as leads all the way through school. Then Not I me. <laughs> <laughs> then I started auditioning outside of school. My parents don't even know this. I don't even know if my mom knows this, this story, but they held an open call on Long Island. I was nine, and my friend's mother was taking him to go to this audition for the understudy for Shenandoah, which was currently running on Broadway. Oh my gosh. And I went, and I auditioned, and they wanted to see me again, but my mom didn't know I went to the audition. I was too afraid to tell her, so I never went back. Oh my god. Yeah. Oh yeah. my, that was one of the biggest Broadway shows of the t in, the, in the day. This is probably the first time I think I've ever told that story publicly. So your biggest big thing, first thing, was Santa Barbara. That was my first real professional acting job. I was 20. Yeah. I mean, how, how did that, were you out here then? I was out here and I was living, <laughs> I was living in a house. Uh, I was renting a bedroom from my high school drama teacher. Gay guy. 
straight woman who I pre- straight woman. Oh who, my god, who I'd previously been accused of sleeping with while I was a senior even in better. high school. Even better. Oh, so you were hot. Uh, whatever it was. So, yeah. So, I was renting a room from her, and another woman was living in the house. It was like three's company. <laughs> <laughs> it really was. And the woman's cousin worked in the casting office at Santa Barbara and was over for Christmas one night. And I had just asked Santa Claus at the uh, gallery. I took my picture with Santa Claus, and I just asked him, like, uh, what do you want for Christmas? I went, oh, a part on a TV show. And literally the next night, this guy was sitting at a table in our house. And he's like, yeah, I got something I could give you. Yeah, they were off for Christmas. I shot it like January 3rd. I just came in. I did three lines. And then they gave me a little. Then they liked me, and they kept me for a couple of weeks. And then I totally blew it. How did you blow it? Oh, man, I didn't know anything. I was a kid. I had no guidance. I was living in the street, basically. You know, I had this house that I had just gotten into. I had no management, and I was on the set, and I did a take, and frankly, I didn't like the take, and I looked right into the camera at the director, and I went, you think we can try, you think we can try that again? And that was the very last day I ever worked. Was that live? No, they oh, taped them. <laughs> no, they Because, you know, a lot of those in those days were live. Right. Live to tape. Live to tape, And which, yeah. for those at home don't know what live to tape is, live to tape me- means that you shoot the show, and unless you're having a heart attack, you don't stop because they're going to use exactly what they do because they edit while they're shooting. Right. So if you stop like you did, because I'm assuming it was a live to well, tape. Well, here's the comedy, is that I had seen the stars doing that. I thought it was okay to do. I thought it was like, oh, yeah, you, you know, that's okay. You could just stop and... I didn't know. I was like a nobody. I had like two lines in every show. It was like terrible. Last time I ever worked. Dark oh, my fire. God. Finish. Oh, my God. Yeah, that was... And then I went and got a job at Paramount, and that's how I started doing stand-up. Oh, God. So yeah. where did you start your stand-up career? The uh, old Laugh Factory. Oh, God. <laughs> so we call it the bowling alley. <laughs> he says with... Disgusted. No, no, no. We used to call it the bowling alley, the old one. It remember? was. It was like it was, it was just that long room. Exactly. And you'd sit there and you'd do and you'd stand in line. But it was it wasn't that hard to do stand up in those days. There were no comics. You were just waiting you would just wait around and if you were any good, they'd have you back. There were no comics. Yeah. You know, unfortunately for me, um, wow, it was you know, there's so much fodder in my career it isn't even funny. And some of it still funnels to this day. So I started doing stand-up because Mark Price was... Well, he used to be on a show called Family Ties. Correct. He played, in the 80s. Right. He played Skippy on Family Ties, the number one television show in the galaxy for the Which record. made him a really big star, even Huge. as a recurring character. Huge. And at the time, the Laugh Factory was this tiny little dump of a club, for people who don't know. Next now, to a Chinese restaurant. Next to Ah Fong's Chinese restaurant. Which I loved. Which is, me too, which is now the showroom. Yes. Okay. So I got the in. lobby is the club, right? <laughs> so I got into the Laugh Factory because Mark walked me in there and said to Jamie, "You got to put my friend Richie on. You got to put my friend Richie on." So you know how Jamie hates to be told what to do, but oh. Mark was keeping his doors open because he was very big at the time. And Mark worked that club every Friday and Saturday night after the Family Ties taping. He'd go and do a set, and then he'd do Saturday night also. So uh, Jamie had to put me up, and I did real well, and. Then I was just doing okay like everybody else. You kill your first night and then you just tank it for like Oh yeah, yeah, you just like all of a sudden. What is that when you do really well your first show and then afterwards it's because you keep trying to repeat what you thought was funny rather than stay in the moment. Well, for us there's two answers to that question. Cuz I did the same thing. I did the comedy store the first night it and killed. I killed followed uh Damon Wayans fire followed me. Little did I know later on that that would become a big deal in my right. career cuz I got to he hired me for my wife and kids. Literally, uh, probably 15 years later. Uh, and remembered that night, probably. Oh, no, because I used to drive him home all the time oh, because he didn't have a car. Right. <laughs> That's so awesome. So we'd all, you know, you'd hang out. You know, a nice Jewish boy had a car, you know, <laughs> that my mother gave me, a Camaro, you know. And uh, he, I just knew him when we'd hang around and they'd all make fun of me because I was a closeted gay guy. Right. And they'd all tease and abuse me. It was like going back to high school again. And, <laughs> and you just started, I mean, Drew Carey, you know, all these, yeah. so many that I work with, Jim Vallelay. Sure. I work, uh, you know, uh, so many people that I work with that had g- 
basically given me jobs. George Lopez. I, when I started, it was Rich Jenny. It was all, you know. Um, oh, God bless him. John Panette, you know, who took me out. Mitch Hedberg, who took me out. All these guys that you wind up knowing because you all start at the same time. Or they were actually above you. Seinfeld. Oh, uh, You know. He's a little uh, before me. Well, he was, he was that guy who, I didn't know comedy in high school. Oh, he was the guy that set the template for everybody. Right, because I remember when I was 20, if I were hanging out at the improv, and he walked in, it was like, oh, Seinfeld's here. Exactly. Seinfeld's here, you know, he was like the big headliner. Let's take a break, and we're going to come back and talk with Rich about his comedy career and how we all got into working with some of the, probably the biggest people in show business. <laughs> we're going to take a break. We'll be right, we're back at Absolutely Jason Stewart with Rich Chasler. Don't change that channel. Oh, my God, we don't have a channel. Don't change that internet. There is no channel. Don't change it. We'll be right back. Watching T Radio V, Radio in TV. I'm Laura Somoza. I'm Sterling Gardner. And we are Between the Sheets every Monday here, 3 p.m. TRadioV.com. T Radio V. That's right, it's T Radio V, Radio in TV. What is that face? <laughs> he wants to see our hands. That's radio. N. T. V. Wah, 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 wah. We're not a couple. <laughs> <laughs> Hi kids, Billy Francesca here for my brand new show at T Radio V, Advice from an Idiot, every Thursday from 7 to 8 p.m. Pacific time. So please call in and get some advice from someone who knows absolutely nothing about everything. Hey, my fellow thoughters out there, I'm Charles Shaughnessy. Check out my new show, Here's a Thought, with Charles Shaughnessy, August the 7th, 3 p.m. PST, right here on T-Radio V. Now, you know I have a lot to say, but I want to hear what you have to say. So tune in, grab your phones, call me, tweet me, email me in the studio, and let's get this conversation going. Here's a Thought, starting August the 7th, 3 p.m. PST, right here on T-Radio V. That's radio in TV. watching T Radio V Radio in TV Hey, we're back at Absolutely Jason Stewart with my guest, Rich Chasner. Um, we're talking about comedians. And so you've really, you probably had a much better career opening for people than I did. I just, you know, I was like a road warrior for like 20 years. I mean, I started probably in the mid 80s as a middle. And then I, around 90, early 90s, I started headlining the shit rooms. And then by the time I came out, in the mid '90s, I hit I had a headline for like 20 years in clubs. Yeah, and just you know, so I never got to work with almost all the really great people. I always wanted to open for some of the really big people in theaters and stuff, and I never got to do that because I went right into to headlining, and I thought that was the goal. For some reason, that was the goal. I don't know why. Well, don't be fooled. I mean, yeah, I got there's, lucky. There's other ways to go about doing it too. Yeah, I mean, look, you could be on the ships forever and you know, see the world for free and work two nights a week, and some people want to blow their um, their brains out, you know? Yeah. I mean, so, but don't be fooled. The cruises is what he's talking about. Uh, uh, yes, working cruise lines. So when you see those comedians on cruise lines, if you do, please be very, very nice to them. <laughs> They're working really hard. It's a hard. It's a hard. It's a hard job. And the cruise people are crazy. The people yes, that run from it. From what I understand, a lot of yeah. the cruise people are a little crazy. Yeah, yeah. And if you're a cruise person, and if you ever see me on one of your cruises, I'll be very, very nice to you. <laughs> <laughs> you have to. I'll still get ready. I know. Um, no, but don't be fooled, Jason. Seriously, I spent a lot of time working those rooms. And yeah, I, you, no, I know that. I was on the road. Who was your favorite opening for? 
big comedian or yeah, road yeah. comedian? Either. Well, I think my favorite act I opened for on the road um, was a guy named Steve O. Oh, yeah. Do you remember Steve really O? Really good looking, too. Really yeah. unusual for a comedian. Because, yeah. you know, it's usually yeah. character guy. There's a small group of us. Yeah. Um, Steve O is probably one of my favorite guys because he was one of those guys that not only was he so funny. Can I you say could, that? You could say fucking oh, funny. Oh, good. He was so fucking funny, but he also would like hang out with you after the show and you'd go up to his room and, you know, like you'd smoke pot or, you know, do other stuff. Always, and, that's what I always did. I always was really, I, I learned from other headliners right. the first five years of being a middle act that you are nice to your, your opening act, you're nice to your middle act. But you know what's really interesting is Roseanne told me something, Roseanne Barr. Right. She said, don't ever become friends with your opening act until you see his act, because if he sucks, you don't want to be friends with him. <laughs> because, and I said, why? It said, because he'll call you, and he'll want you to help him, and you can, and That's you're going to have to tell him he's a loser. That's hilarious. You know, and that was something I really learned very young. So if they weren't really great, I had to be nice but keep a distance. Right. They were, I mean, I, I, we, we used to you'd go get, live in a comedy condo, which is a, 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 a usually this terrible apartment with three bedrooms or two bedrooms. Or an ugly house that they rent that has, like, seriously uh, terrible carpeting and that was the one cable. In, that was the one in Atlanta. And if Ollie right? Joe Prater stayed there before you, they had cut off all long-distance calls, so you had to have a calling card. Card. Oh yeah, you had to have a phone you know? card. And don't Nobody eat had the phones. mayonnaise was always the joke. Don't uh -huh. eat the mayonnaise in the comedy condo because some comic inevitably jerked off in it before he left after his week. Oh really? Don't tell me you ever used the condiments in the fridge. <laughs> oh my god, I never knew that. You knew you liked Miracle Whip for a reason. Somebody would leave, leave things in the drawer, and someone would leave a, a, a gay magazine or like something in the drawer <laughs> for me, hilarious. and they knew I was coming when I came out, which I thought was really funny. People thought that I would be offended by it. I was never yeah. really offended. But no, I was John Yodering it uh, around the Midwest for. Oh, you did the, the what I call the bus and truck. Just like you, man. I was. I didn't flying. do those a lot. I flew out either had my middle act or my excuse me when I was a middle act. I either rented a car or I flew to New York and borrowed a friend's car oh. and drove all over the Midwest for six, seven weeks at a pop. Yeah, I never did that home. as oh, much. I did, I did it in California. I did it in California a lot, but never uh, all over the country. Oh, the adventures. So this is the list. So tell me, what was you know, Mitch Hedberg? A lot of people might not know, know who he was. Oh, Mitch. You know, because he, he passed away of a heroin overdose. And he was, he was basically one of the first what I would call performance artist comedians that sort of became it. He was like in the, uh, you know, he, he was <coughs> just so funny, but in a different kind of way. Mitch it was, wasn't dot, 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 dot. Mitch was, in my opinion, probably the consummate joke writer. Seriously. And really? I, oh, my goodness gracious. Go YouTube some of his act okay. now and rewatch. And you will see how unbelievably brilliant his jokes are. And there's zero fat in all of them. And it was very natural for him, you know. He had this way of writing just, I mean, I have a girlfriend named Lynn. And I have an ex-girlfriend named Lynn. But my new girlfriend only spells her name with one N. So I have to be very careful that I don't call her by my ex-girlfriend's name, Lynn. That's what I mean. That's what I, you know really, what I mean? Really, really, he was very, very different. It's perfectly written. Oh, yeah, but still, but he was really different. Really different in his approach. Yeah. And when I first met Mitch, Mitch was one of these guys, I thought Mitch was the funniest guy in the room, and... So did every other comedian. No, nobody got him... Really? Mitch and I met at a comedy competition in Colorado. We spent two weeks together, and there were 15 comics in this competition touring around. Judy Brown and Steve Marmel were running. I remember. Okay? And out of 15 comics every night, after every show, Mitch would go, man, Chasler, you are the funniest guy in this thing. And after Mitch had said, I'd go, man, you are the funniest guy in this thing. And after every show, Mitch and I finished 14th and 15th. Wow. Every single show. We were getting beat by guys in a wheelchair. Like, it was unbelievable. How, and we laughed about that for years. Wow. Yeah. So then Mitch, Dave Becky signed him. Dave Becky, a big manager. Got him a deal uh, with the improv. Got a gig, called me, asked me to open for him. And the next thing I knew, we were, like, on the road for four years. Wow. 
clubs or theaters? I started in clubs, and then he started selling out the clubs, and then we did some theaters. Yeah, it was. Wow. It was in that was an adventure too. <laughs> what about what about uh, George Wallace? George Wallace, man, George Wallace was like working with a comedy general. You know George? Oh God, yeah. Okay, so you know what it's like to talk to George. Oh yeah. Okay, well imagine getting that for twenty minutes after you get off stage or after a show. You know how George is, man. Let me tell you something, right? So he would watch your act no matter what. What? George, Put the camera on me. Look at that face. I don't know if you if you can't see Jason's face. His chin is on the table. Well, the, the headliner watches the opening act because there was no feature, right? There with was, George, there was no. When you feature. did these, you were just it. That's right. You were doing both jobs. Right, and I got lucky. When I got that gig, I got it from David Gladstone, and uh, I did, I opened for George in Anaheim, and he thought I was funny, and maybe he thought I was cute. I didn't know at the time that that mattered to George, but. Um, he, Next thing I knew, I opened for George in Vegas, and I opened for George in Tahoe, and I opened Wow. For, yeah, and George watched my act every night. Why? Because he loves comedy, man. He's like about, from my experience, was that George was all about the comedy. Man. Yeah, and he never, like, it was always that, it was always cool with me. You know, he never, but he must have seen me hitting on girls, so that might have, you know, just... I don't know. I'm just saying. And every night he'd give me notes. Wow. Every night. And you know when you do this thing about the shopping with your mother? You know, well, don't let us not see your face. You're making funny faces, but you're turning away from the crowd. You gotta see your faces. That's funny. Yeah. Re <clears throat> Rita Redner. Fired me after three shows. And then hired <coughs> me back. First time I worked for Rita, I didn't know that you had. They said, look, you gotta work clean. I'm not a clean guy. Oh, she's so she's so super, clean, super clean. Not even, not even. You can't say fuck or cunt. It's that. <laughs> <laughs> it's not even that. It's that you can't even have material that <coughs> isn't about Oreo cookies. Pass me a water before I choke to death. Oreo cookies or singing nightingales. Really? Yeah. Now, if it's about singing nightingales, flying out of a pussy, not okay. So I worked for I've Rita. met her, but only in passing. What is she like? Um, she was um, sort of non-existent. Off stage, um, I mean. Yeah. Off stage. You know, she was. She goes for being a dancer. Well, she. So everything was very. You could see her act was almost choreographed. Well, not only that. Because she used to be. She, you know, she, when I was doing the Riviera uh, for, I think it was uh, Steve Sharippa. <coughs> who used to book it? Who became right. a, who became a very successful actor? Right. Sharippa used to book the Riv. She was doing a show in the bigger room next door, and I would go over and watch her. And I thought this woman with the sweetest little act was hysterically amazing. It, right. was, it was just amazing how she did what she did. Rita was very, very. She is a very um, specific person about everything I noticed when I worked with her. Like even how she drinks her water and how she does. Everything is very, she's very rigid. Oh, wow. And yeah, and I did my set, and I thought I had worked clean, and her road manager, I guess it was, came up to me afterwards and said, um, tomorrow night, Rita would like you not to do the thing about the heavy metal guys getting dressed. I don't know, all right, fine. You know, it was just these guys putting on their spandex pants. I thought it was pretty funny, and they go, uh, you know, screw music. I just want to dance, you know. And I, oh, because she was probably afraid that you were offending her gay followers, or maybe because I used the word screw. screw. Uh, yeah, can you believe that? Crazy. We're gonna take a break. We're gonna be right back here on Absolutely Jason Stewart with my guest Chris Chasler, and we're gonna go back down some of the more comedians he's got to work with. This is really exciting. This is a lot of fun. Yeah, we'll be right back after this commercial message. Stay with us. Don't. You are watching T Radio V. Radio in TV. T Radio V. What did you play opposite Andy Carrick? Do you remember? Uh, Andy and I worked as uh, two employees at a network. Okay. Oh, you're and forgetting the other I, thing. I played. I played. I played a news anchor and. You played a reporter. Okay, but the other thing you did, the thing you did on the Andy Dick show, who did you play to Andy? 
Oh, uh, is, is that gonna play my sister? You played his wife, Denise. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you played his wife. Yeah. So what's wrong with that? Yeah. Yeah. Nothing's wrong with it. He's got it's a great just, range as an actor. It, you know? Yeah, it just was funny. Encounters with Eric and Eliza Roberts, Wednesdays from 2 to 4 p.m. on T Radio V. Hi, I'm Valerie Lansberg, and most people know me as Doris from the television series Fame. You're watching Absolutely Jason Stewart on T Radio V. You're watching Jason Stewart on TV Radio V. Fame. Hi, I'm Plastic Martyr, and I've got a new show called Just Like You on T-Radio V. It's an inside look into my Hollywood life where I give you a sneak peek into a world of beauty, fashion, and fame. Illusions will be shattered. And of course, there's a little sex hugs and rock and roll. Be sure to check it out Wednesdays at 11, only on T-Radio V. Hello, T Radio V. Hello for us. Hi, guys. My name is Steve Ranazizi. My name is Mary Elizabeth Ellis. My name is Katie Azelton. You're watching TV on the radio. Well, you're not watching it, you're listening to it because radio on TV. Hi, T Radio V. Keep that radio going inside that television set. I love T Radio V. Trust her. T Radio V. Radio in TV. Radio in TV. You are watching T Radio V, radio in TV. <laughs> hey, we're back. <laughs> And that absolutely say Stuart, my guest, Rich <laughs> Tasler. Um, so tell me, I, I gotta, I gotta know, uh, Richard Jenny. I, I opened Whoa. for him in Minneapolis in, I don't remember what club it was. I think it was a Funny Bone. And I got to tell you, he was terrific to me. He's amazing, right? And so much cool, like so much cool, just comes out of him. Yeah, I just remember watching his show, and of course, not getting it. Because of all the girl boy references, right? <laughs> but he was so wonderful uh, to work with, and you know, he really tells you something about mental illness because he didn't take his medication because he right. didn't think he needed it, right? Which is the same thing my mother's fourth husband did, and a lot of people who are schizophrenics or have depression or bipolar or whatever it is, if you're, you know, to stop taking medication is the worst thing you can probably do. Yeah, next to self medicating. Or not. Yeah. You know. But he was, you know. Rich was a sad one. I mean, I loved Rich, you know. And I, he was from New York, you know. Like, he was one of those Long Island comics who came up like, like a generation before me. But with all the guys, Dave Hawthorne, uh, Lenny Travis, all these guys who wound up, John Mulrooney, you know, all these guys who wound up writing for the big shows and Still, a lot of them got pilots. A lot of them got pilots. Still, all of them got signed by Rick but I always, Messina. But I always think, you know, the, 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 things have to be so different now. I think a lot of those guys probably it wouldn't happen for them in the same way because the way it happened was it was absolutely not because of the way they looked, but because of their act. Yeah. Whereas it's, now it's about the way they look, what race you are, what reference you are, whatever it is. It's all about, it, you, like you'll see Last Comic Standing or any of these shows, and you'll see that it's all set up in terms of, one of each, and it's never about who's the best. All right, so let me ask you a question, and I get this question in almost every single interview I ever do, whether it's radio on the road or what, it, what is the thing that bothers you most about today's generation of comedian? Um, it's not that it bothers me, I just don't connect to it. I don't think that somebody who's so young I'll tell you what bothers me then. <laughs> they ahead. haven't paid their dues enough. Right. And they haven't really, they don't, when you tour, you learn to work with the whole country. Yeah. When you live in New York or LA, specifically even more in New York, your show becomes specifically for one group of people. Whereas what we were taught was to 
find out how to make people laugh everywhere Correct. and work in any situation. Yeah, Jerry Seinfeld says, until you can walk into a room anywhere in the world and make everyone in that room laugh for an hour, you're not a stand-up comedian. And I kind of agree with that, you know, because there's something to be said about being able to be geographically diverse in terms of your writing. You know, not just writing for one geographic area of the country. But now I think it's changed because a lot of times they want things for uh, specific audiences. I don't know. I just think that a lot of the kids today have issues with they they don't know how to write jokes. That's what I tell everyone. Well, that's not what's funny to them anymore because YouTube and everything has changed everything. I mean, a couple years ago they had YouTube stars on the red carpet interviewing people supposed comedians and it was probably one of the biggest debacles I saw that and it was horrible it was was for the uh, daytime yeah and because they didn't really understand that that's a different venue and you have to be able to change in terms of what you were doing for that audience interviewing also that's a very very good point very good point you have to be able to change what you're doing for that audience and interviewing um, as you know I've hosted two shows is an art form in and of itself and requires tremendous listening skills, which a lot of those people haven't even developed yet. There's still a couple more I want to ask you about. Though. All right, go ahead. Nick Schwartzen. All right, so I haven't worked with Nick on the road yet, but I'm going on the road with Nick in April. Oh, you are? I am. So you work with him at the Improv. Oh, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. Nick and I are very good friends. Yeah. Absolutely. We actually met through Mitch Hedberg. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Probably about 15, 18 years ago. Wow. Yeah, he's an amazing guy. Uh, does he do theaters? Yeah, we're doing. We're starting at a university, so I'm guessing oh. it's going to be 2,000 people. Oh wow! Yeah, and that's going to be tremendously fun. I am really that. There I, is there is no god. There is no rules with him. There is no oh god. There is no rules. Yeah. And in fact, we're doing. He literally came to me and he's like, "Man, I'm doing Sonoma State University up in wine country. You got to come with me now." Avi, you know, he knows I'm a wine collector and a guy who loves wine. So he's like, I've got a friend up there who played in, I'm trying to remember what band, I think it was like, I want to say Sticks or something like that. And he goes, he makes wine up in Sonoma, so he's going to come to the show and he's going to bring us wine. We just got to go. I'm like, okay, this sounds fun. God, let me say another one. Um, Dennis Leary, who I loved his show, Rescue Me. Dennis Leary is, uh, Dennis Leary is a freaking genius. He is. I think Dennis Leary. He doesn't do stand up anymore. Not really. No. Yeah. This was. I met Dennis Leary at Igby's. Oh wow! Remember Igby's? Oh, okay, yeah. Comedy so, club here in West Los Angeles. Right. So I met Dennis Leary at Igby's, and Dennis Leary thought I was edgy. Uh, truth is, I was copying what I saw Dennis Leary do the week before. <laughs> That's the truth. I was wow. 21 years old. So Dennis asked me to open for him at the Ice House. I opened for him at the Ice House, and then I opened for him at some place up in Bakersfield. It's what like, kind of guy is he? Intense, funny, opinionated, um, funny. He was, now again, I haven't seen him in 20 years. How about John Panette? <sighs> guy I cross for John, uh-huh. even though I'm Jewish. You know, John was one of my dearest friends, like Mitch, mm. the three of us. John was... A. E. John was as amazing as they get. Did you see him when he toured in Hairspray? I did. I saw him in New York. Yeah. yeah. That was like 2002. I had just moved back to New York. What made him do that? I mean, it was so different. And out of the, uh, out of, out of, I was sort of go, oh my gosh. John has, I didn't even know he was an actor. John has a brilliant singing voice. John was an accountant. He was a bookkeeper. And he just had all this talent in him. And he had a lot of issues from growing up, and he started doing stand-up in Boston. And the next thing you know, like, Larry Shapiro found him, got him out to L.A., and John started working. And then he was writing like crazy and had all this material, and then he was on Star Search. But then let's show, let's, let's show a clip. We're talking about stand-up. Why don't we show a clip of your stand-up comedy? And this is from the Ice House, which is probably one of my all-time favorite clubs to I work on. I work there as often as humanly possible. Oh, it's my favorite it's club in the, the country. Best. You can't explain to people how much, yeah. Why don't we play that clip? So my name is Richard Chastler. I know I look Italian. I'm not. I'm half Jewish and half French, which means what I don't buy wholesale, I design myself. (laughs) Thank you very much. I'm a New Yorker originally. How many New Yorkers do we have here? (laughs) All right, three of us. We could take them, right? Where are you from? Yonkers. Yonkers, nice. You? 
Westchester. That's like pussy New York. That's like, I'm from LA, where? Riverside. It's kind of like locale New York, diet New York you're from. I'm from Brooklyn, New York. I'm from the city where people talk like pigeons. We do, we can't help it, guys from Brooklyn. We talk our neck moves like we're pecking bread off a bench in Central Park. It just sort of happens, it's just. And we hurt ourselves when we talk. Yo, Joey. Yo, Vinny, yo, Tommy. Yo, Bob. And get no respect and get no response until we get really low, right? Hey, yo, Vinny. What is it, a snorkel? How does that work? You touch here, you sniff here. How does that happen? I, I, I was stoned in biology. I never got to that chapter. I, there's drug addicts running around Harlem going. <laughs> Come on, let's all make. Come on, let's all make that noise, shall we? That was hysterically <clears throat> funny. That was hysterically funny. I watched that when I when I picked it. That was the one I picked. Oh, really? Because you sent me a lot of tapes. That was hysterically funny. Thank you. I was very, um, I was really, I hadn't seen your show in so long, and I was very, uh, I laughed out loud. So I thought, oh, gosh, I totally forgot. You know, because we sometimes, we, I don't watch comedy as much anymore. Right. You also, when you're working, you don't get to see a lot of your friends working. Because no, because once, work you, once you start headlining, you really don't get to see a lot of your friends But I friends do a lot of the group anymore. shows, too. Well, we do group shows here in town, but... Yeah, yeah, know. I love that. Well, thank you. I that's, loved it. Those are, that's very nice of you to say. I'm actually... That made me... Uh, that made my cheeks hurt. So tell me, tell me uh, about some of the movies. Oh, we only have two minutes. Okay. Really? Yeah, I want to talk about some of the movies. So we're going to take a break, and we're going to come back. Uh, we're going to talk about some of the movies about working with Helen Mirren and Anthony Hopkins and Al Pacino. And oh, yeah. And Christopher Plummer, who's a real fucking asshole. <laughs> really? I hear, I hear he's sick and dying. Good fucking No, ladies. stop that. No, stop I'm that. Kidding, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Stop. Stop. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Uh, Edelweiss. Yes. It's Edelweiss. not that we don't love. The movie. Every morning to greet me, small and white, clean, clean and, and bright, bright. You'll, you'll be, be having having me. And let's go to a commercial. And, and bloom and go, bloom and grow forever. Edelweiss. watching T Radio V Radio in TV Hey geeks wake up we've got big news I'm not going to mumble this time Geekscape the long running movie video game color Let me do one more Hey geeks we got big news Geekscape your favorite show about movies video games comics and TV is coming to T Radio V Monday October 6th and it'll be on every Monday from then on 7 p.m. until the apocalypse happens we're all eating by zombies Hi, I'm Plastic Martyr, and I've got a new show called Just Like You on T Radio V. It's an inside look into my Hollywood life where I give you a sneak peek into a world of beauty, fashion, and fame. Illusions will be shattered. And of course, there's a little sex, hugs, and rock and roll. Be sure to check it out Wednesdays at 11, only on T Radio V. Hi, I'm Frances Fisher, and you're watching Absolutely Jason Stewart on T Radio V. So it's T Radio in a V? Yeah, yeah. T Radio V. I've been TV here six months. Radio okay. So in the between. TV goes inside the, the No, the radio's inside the TV. And then, so it's both? Yeah. And that's my show. That's your show. And you just did my show. Yeah. Oh, God, I'm so excited. <laughs> I feel like we're crashing into a Titanic. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I'm Zoe Williams. And I'm Dr. Mark Goulston. I'm Jeff Brown. And we make up the Zoe What Morning Show. You can find us here on TRadioV.com every Monday at 11 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. I make you think. He makes you laugh. And if I get a chance, I'll help you change. Or make you cry with his attempts at humor. Radio in TV. Can you relate? We'll make it happen. Look at Jeff. What you doing? 
Were you mumbling to yourself? <laughs> hey, back there mumbling. To them. To them. You are watching T Radio V. Radio in TV. We are back. Hey, Jason Stewart, uh, absolutely Jason Stewart, with my guest Chris Chasler. I am having the best time with you, by the way. I can't oh, even thank tell you. you. I was so excited when you asked me to be on the oh, show. Oh, I'm so glad you could really. be here. I love you. I don't get to see you a lot. Oh. You're, you're truly someone I really like, adore, and yeah. Oh, my God. Yeah. It's like a crush. <laughs> um, so you were in the movie called The Insider, which is one of my favorites. It's a Michael Mann film with Al Pacino. Yeah. Debbie Basner. I mean, Debbie Mazur. Christopher Plummer. Yes. Great Christopher cast. Plummer, who's a wonderful, amazing guy, by the way, Christopher Plummer. One of the nicest people. Well, why did you I've say that then? Because he's a prick. He was miserable, to be perfectly honest with you. Like, people tried to talk to him, even crew people. He was just, he was very. Um, just having a bad day. Yeah, maybe. How long did you work on the film? Uh, four days. Wow, and you played an intern that worked at CBS. For those who don't know, the movie is about uh, the 60-minute piece that was done about Mike... Jeffrey Wigand, who worked for... Um, uh, uh, I'm trying to remember the cigarette company, broke the story about how bad cigarettes are on 60 Minutes yeah. and how the cigarette companies are covering up the information. Right. It was Brown and Williamson. Yes. Jeffrey Wigand worked for Brown Williamson, and Mike Wallace was the one. And who that's took the isn't story. it that who Pacino played? No, Pacino played the producer. Wait, uh, who played Mike Wallace? Was uh, Christopher the nice guy plumber? Yeah, plumber, yeah. Yeah. Wow, well, yeah. I'm really trashing him here, aren't I? I gotta stop. Oh well, well he's he, not casting anything. Fuck him. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. It's not I'm kidding. Advice, advice. <laughs> um, so, what was it like working with Pacino? Pacino was awesome. And he smokes a lot, and he always smells like cigarettes. Wow. Yeah, smokes. Oh, let me tell you something. I need a cigarette. The minute he called cut, give me a cigarette. Oh, and he's like four feet three. <laughs> I'm serious. The wi they have to be very careful. They run these special things for the wires so Pacino can walk under them. No, I'm just kidding. But he really is tiny. And he's but he really loves to rehearse. Loves to rehearse. And not only that, he literally, like, I'm standing in the room. I don't even have a line. And he's so aware of filmmaking, he's really, really good at it, that he literally says to me, he goes, you should move your left arm a third of an inch off your body, because then we'll see the fact that you have absolutely nothing to do with this scene a little bit better. Like, that's really how, like, he's really, oh, wow. yeah, he's really. And Debbie Mazur? Um, she was wonderful. She was very, very nice. Um, I was afraid of her. <laughs> what, me I too. was. I'm not lying. Yeah. I, you see, I got that job as a favor. I didn't audition. But everything is a favor in this That town. was. I had starred in Michael Mann, Michael Mann who directed The Insider and many other brilliant films and was the brains behind Miami Vice on TV. And Heat. And Heat and Last of the Mohicans and goes on and on. Yeah. So his daughter, Amy Kanan Mann, hired me as the lead in her first film. And Michael was at the screening and literally looked at me, turned around and looked at me during the movie, and he goes, you win an Oscar one day. You will win an Oscar one day. Wow. Really? So when they did what the- What the fuck happened? I don't know. I would I'm call still him. working at it. I, I, would what do you mean? I would call him and go, where's the Oscar? He's not even working, really. He, you know, Is he not? It takes him like 10 years to make a movie. But He's got something going now. I think so. But yeah. I got lucky, and- um, when it came time to do that movie, one of the people who worked on the casting for Amy was working on the casting for that movie. And she literally called me and said, hey, I can get you a little bit of work if you want to do extra work. And I was like, what? She's like, well, you know, I go, no, I don't really want to do any extra work. So I went down to the set one day to see her, just to say hello, and they were shooting in Marina Del Rey. Uh -huh. And I saw Michael, who was like, hey, I, re I remember you. And I was like, yeah, how come I'm not in your movie? And he looks at her and he goes, find him something. Like that. So it was like a favor deal. Wow. Yeah, it was a Kathy Smith, I think. Kathy, I'm trying to remember the casting director. Still, find yeah. him something. It was like that. And That's he walked lovely. away. So she called me like Monday, the following Monday, which was like the week of my birthday. And she said, look, it's sort of like a glorified extra part, but you know, you'll get a credit and you'll be, there's a few lines that, you know, and we're going to write in more. And Did they write in more? 
I got to improvise a little bit. With Pacino? With Pacino and Debbie Mazur. Oh, my God. They didn't keep any of it. It all hit the doesn't floor. Doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. But still. Didn't matter. I got to improvise with Tony Collette. Man. That the director called Golden. Wow. And it didn't make it. Well, that doesn't mean anything. It's usually, sometimes it's just because your part didn't have much to do with the, you know, the trajectory of the script and where it was going. That was in Hitchcock. It, no, what happened there was a, <laughs> that was a sick story. Well, you were in the movie Hitchcock with Helen Mirren. With Helen Mirren. And Anthony Hopkins. A sir and a dame. Yes. I was in a movie with a and sir and a dame. you played the late uh, Martin Balsam. The late, great Martin Balsam. Oscar-winning actor from A Thousand Clowns, who people might remember from Archie Bunker's plays. Yes, he was on Archie Bunker's and plays. And so many things. And uh, But he played Detective Arborgast in Psycho. Yes. And uh, remember, they pushed him down the stairs. Exactly. So um, that was a very interesting experience. Tell me about it. Well, I I, first of all, I got to meet a great friend named Wally Langham on that movie. Oh, I like Wally. Okay, Smart. Wally's a great guy. You should have him on the show. I, how can I get him? I'll help you do it. I would love that. Wally's fantastic. You know, and he just finished up CSI, and uh -huh. so he just For directed years. a movie. Yeah, yeah, he's great. So Wally played a guy named uh, Saul Bass, who was the DP for um, Alfred Hitchcock. It's the director of photography. And cinematography. during the shooting, Saul Bass's family contacted Fox and said, we don't want our father really portrayed in the movie we changed our mind so all of my scenes all of my work all three days every scene i'm in is with saul bass oh wow so virtually 90 percent of all the work that we did you have one nice scene yeah actually they, they kept one nice one and then they kept this uh two shots with me and helen mirren but the dialogue what's was she like amazing uh -huh. So I'm in love with someone who is the most amazing human I've ever had the pleasure of knowing. And she's Seriously. exactly like Helen Mirren? In fact, you've met her. Yes, I have. And she is truly magical and amazing. And she has this presence that when she walks in the room, it, the room just changes. Well, you're glowing. I am glowing because I, yeah. And she's like Helen Mirren? Helen Mirren also has that quality. Oh, wow. Yeah, it's really something to be and around. And she came her. to it later in life, and really because her husband, Taylor Hackford, gave her this really great part, I remember, in a film called White Nights. Yes. And she, it sort of changed her career. Go backwards. Do you, you wouldn't remember this because you weren't jerking off to cable as a young Caligula. Teen. Helen Mirren did uh, another movie. But she was a theater actress. Right, yeah. and then she did like a softcore porn type film that made it to like late night cable. What, what, what film was it? Uh, we have to Google it. Is it called the, the three, the, the, the this with three things? The, not, the, no, I, 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 she plays a teacher. I want to say private lessons. Oh yes, I know those films. Is that, but it was something like yeah, yeah, that. Yeah, 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 yeah. The British and version of that. Something like, yes. Yeah, and yeah. so Helen Mirren absolutely did some nudie nude stuff. Oh yeah, she doesn't care about that. It did, no, of course she doesn't. She has so much grace and dignity and tell me she reminds me of this this woman dana again whoop you you know yes i have she's amazing hi dana if you're watching um yeah helen mirren really has that same sort of uh um yeah she's wonderful did you work with uh, anthony hopkins at i all? did not you know what i love what he says and i keep it in my mind all the time whenever i do something he says i read the script a hundred times meaning because he's the lead so he reads his part right you know, and, I, and that's a, a thing that I do sometimes. Me is too. I kept reading, reading my part over and over to see. And then I'll, after like 20 times, you go, oh, my God, something else comes out. That's, and I didn't realize that yes, from and him. And I learned that from him. Stella used to say that. You know, I trained with Stella Adler, the great acting, acting teacher. Coach. And she said, you know, there's a difference between great actors and brilliant actors. Oh, wow. Yeah. And the great actors see maybe six or seven choices. The brilliant actors see 12, 15. Wow. Yeah. That's wonderful. I know. It's really, really, really big stuff. So is there any other film that you love working on? You, d you directed and starred in a short film called Stop. Oh, yes. And you, d you also got to direct Richard Kind. I got it. to direct And it was Richard about Kind. bullies yeah. and stuff. Yeah, which is very timely right now, in fact. You can watch that movie on my website. And we just had, it's funny because a junior high school just liked it and contacted me.
Oh, wow. I think they want to show it. Like, I'm not sure what they want. But it know. played at all sorts of festivals. It did. It played in all sorts of festivals, and we were honored with some awards and lots of nominations. And uh -huh. It was very exciting to be on that side of the camera uh -huh. because other than acting it, I also directed it. And um, having that conversation with actors is a really powerful thing, you know? Well, this has absolutely been fabulous. Are we done? Yes, we are. Can really? We? Yeah. So how can people get a hold of you if they want to? Uh, my website, richardchassler.com. Spell the last name? C-H-A-S-S-L-E-R. Okay. Uh, my Twitter and is the same, Richard Chassler. And they can get all that on your website. That's all on the and website. And you're going to be going on tour with Nick Swartzen? I'll be in Sonoma. I believe it's April 26th. We're working but anybody can go to the site. They anyone can, see can go to the site. My tour dates are on the site. And if you forget his name or anything, you want to get a hold of him, just go to jasonstewart.com, S-T-U-A-R. RT, and I thank you all for listening, and we'll talk to you Jason, all next thanks week. thanks for having me. Hi, Bye. Dana. <laughs> we'll talk to you all next week. Take care. You are watching T-Radio Me, radio and TV.